Hello once again from the Prim Reaper. This is the final segment continuing from the last video I just put out in which I was covering the different communication styles I see in the MRM and their utility. Though this last one is likely going to be quite a bit longer than the other two, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the superior discussion style. It's just that there's a lot involved with it and it covers a wide variety of scenarios. That being said, let's get into it. This is the style of communication that I tend to favor in my own personal communications with other people. The logical, persuasive style is all about taking a reasoned, measured approach to talking about men's rights with others. Now, this style isn't even necessarily about being heavily information or citation focused at all times, though as always this sort of thing does tend to help. Rather, it's more about the way you approach discussions with other people. For example, the most important place to begin when talking about men's issues is not to behave like you're talking about some forbidden or unusual subject. Even saying things like, I know this isn't a topic that gets brought up often or goes over very well, but should be avoided. Instead, the best path forward is to bring it up like you're discussing the most natural subject in the world, not unlike the attitude that someone might take when talking about women's issues. The goal is to sound authoritative, like, I mean, of course men have issues that are unique to them that they have to deal with, obviously. This way, if anyone wants to challenge your statement, it puts them in the defensive position of having to argue against the obvious point that you just made, giving you the power to rattle off several examples in short order where men have distinct disadvantages. However, in my experience, this is 99% of the time not what happens. When you frame your discussion in this way, not only do you get people conceding that, indeed, yes, men are human beings and they have struggles like anyone else would, but you oftentimes get people enthusiastically agreeing with you that, yes, it is absolutely ridiculous that male victims of domestic violence don't have more shelters. Yes, it is really messed up when fathers aren't allowed to see their kids. Yes, it is super gross when men have to suffer with a false accusation of sexual assault without any recourse while the person who made the false accusation gets off scot-free. But this is the key aspect of the logical half of this approach. If you treat men's issues the way they ought to be treated, as though they're as logical as suggesting the sky is blue, many times this will facilitate positive discussion amongst the uninitiated, those who haven't really given much thought to it before, and it will force those who disagree with you to really question their reasons why they disagree in the first place. Don't get me wrong, it won't always change their mind. In fact, for those heavily entrenched in SJW or radical feminist culture, there's a good chance that it won't change their mind, especially if they're in groups. But it is a good way to get them considering their viewpoints and often to show their hand in public discussions. Fortunately, this isn't the only piece of this communication style. The other half is in the persuasive aspect, which I find builds very nicely off of the first half. It's generally unnecessary in people who already agree with you that men have issues worth considering, but in those who want to challenge you, this is where you get the chance to bring out your argumentative skills. And again, only part of this is about throwing down as many peer-reviewed citations as you can. There's really a lot of psychology in being effectively persuasive in your communications with others. Honestly, the approach to being persuasive is just as much a key aspect as the facts you present. As I began to write this out when I was working on the script for the last video, I realized there was really so much to talk about on this one element of communication that I thought I would just go ahead and elaborate on the many different aspects of it in this video instead. After all, the other communication styles I already talked about have their uses, but if your goal is simply to get people to listen to your concerns about men's issues, this is probably going to be the most effective way to going about doing that. So what exactly do I mean when I say there's a lot of psychology in persuasion? Well, of the three communication styles I've discussed, this one is probably the most deliberate and also has a number of different psychological theories behind the art and science of persuading others. I hesitate to talk about it in this manner because it makes it sound manipulative or like I'm trying to insidiously exploit some facet of human psychology. But really, it's just a matter of learning how best to relate to others in ways that can help you to get your point across without turning people off from your cause. I'm not going to lie, there are some psychological tricks that a lot of sites talk about using that legitimately do feel kind of manipulative, some more than others. 
I'll touch briefly about my thoughts on those in a few minutes. But those really aren't what I'm talking about here. These points are just ways to be maximally effective when trying to get other people to see your side of things. 1. Treat your opponents with respect. This can be difficult sometimes, I know, especially when the other person is behaving in a disrespectful way to you or is espousing beliefs that you find to be absolutely reprehensible. However, two wrongs don't make a right, and you're never going to get anywhere if right off the bat you're acting in a way that is dismissive or disrespectful. It may seem like entry-level advice, but treat people the way you want to be treated is a really good policy and the best chance you have of getting people to be willing to listen to you. 2. In a similar vein, try to honestly look at the other person's opinion from their perspective. Try to resist the urge to immediately jump to telling them they're wrong, even if they are objectively unquestionably wrong, as again, this is likely to put an individual straight on the defensive, which is not a good way to get them to open up to new views. In my experiences, one of the most effective ways to get an individual to consider your position is to let them feel heard and understood where they're coming from first. This can involve talking to them in a calm, even tone of voice, rephrasing what they're saying to you, and trying to get into their mindset to really understand where this belief might have taken root in the first place. By doing this, you can actually begin to see the more detailed threads of what they're saying, which can not only help you to better target your arguments to get at the meat of their views, but it can also offer you more insight into the person that you're interacting with, which may, not always, but may, allow you to better understand and relate to their experiences. And if you can relate to somebody, it often changes the way that you interact with them, and often in a way that makes it more likely that they'll be willing to hear you out. I always like to say that I go into debates not with the purpose of winning, but with the purpose of broadening my perspectives or hearing new positions on the matter. Frustrating though it can be sometimes, even listening to people who are flat out wrong or who espouse views that offend me to my core allows me to get more chances to see new patterns of belief and behavior and to gain new insight into how to interact with people who believe and behave differently from myself. In this way, very few discussions are ever a complete waste of time. 3. The way you approach debates definitely matters. This essentially follows from the previous point, but is more about your overall demeanor. Some sites will recommend that you always begin debates in a friendly manner, but I think that this is an oversimplification. It firmly depends on who you're debating with and their approach to discussions. Rather than offering some flat advice like be friendly, I think it's far more effective to say read the room. Some people will appreciate a friendly, disarming approach, but some people might prefer a more professional and straightforward attitude. I wouldn't use the same technique with a group of my friends as I would in one of my classroom discussions, for example, though I would always try to keep point one and two consistent. Number four, you won't always be able to control this, but if you're trying to seriously change someone's mind, it's always better to talk to them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and then preferably in person. God help you if you're trying to start a debate with somebody on social media, for example, where the likelihood of being ganged up on by a group of your opponent's friends increases exponentially. I've seen this happen a lot. In these cases, not only are you far less likely to change anyone's mind, but due to the echo chamber effect and depending on the nature of the friends involved, you might actually further entrench your opponents. Doubly so if they're the type to become insulting and demeaning, because they'll be more likely to feed off this sort of dismissive attitude from each other. Pick your battles wisely. 5. Accept the fact that you're not always going to change everyone's mind, and accept such losses gracefully. If you can go into a debate respectfully and open-mindedly and still fail to change the other person's mind, you can do a number of things. You can chalk it up to the other person being too firmly entrenched in their beliefs. You can chalk it up to mismatched debate style between you two. You can chalk it up to you not presenting the right information for them to change their mind. The list goes on. But whatever you do, accept the loss gracefully. Thank them for talking with you, thank them for considering your points, and firmly but politely agree to disagree. This accomplishes two things. It leaves your debate partner with a more positive memory of your discussion, which can potentially make them more positively disposed to considering similar discussions and talking points in the future. And two, even if it fails to persuade your opponent, others who are party to the debate might be more likely to be convinced by your talking points and your debate presence as well. 
5.5. On the flip side, if you do manage to change someone's mind, you should learn to win gracefully as well. Don't gloat or hold it over your opponent's head that you've won. Again, thank them for taking the time to talk with you and for being open-minded, and perhaps at this point you can even tell them some more personal reasons as to why the issue means so much to you, sort of as a show of trust and gratitude. This can really help to send the point home and can give them some more meat to chew on after the debate is over. These are the key points that I always hold too strongly when talking to others about my viewpoints, and I've generally found them to serve me quite well. But before I close the section on logical, persuasive communication styles and end the video, like all other communication styles, I have to touch on what I feel are the cons of the approach. In the case of this style, that would be the persuasion tricks that I mentioned from before, which I gotta say I really don't see so much as persuasive techniques as manipulation tactics to try to get people to do what you want. I'll lay out a few examples of what I'm talking about. Reliance on authority. Many of you know about the famous Milgram experiment in which participants were ordered by authority figures to deliver increasingly strong shocks to fellow participants who answered quiz questions incorrectly. People are often willing to defer to the expertise of an authority figure in forming their opinions or carrying out their beliefs. But let's think about this for a moment. The Milgram experiment is often held up as an example of questionable ethics in research for a reason. Do you think that those participants' minds were changed on the moral correctness of delivering shock punishments to their peers? I think it's safe to say likely not. The same is going to be true in presenting arguments. Sure, some people might be swayed by the fact that you have a PhD alone, but this is not as likely to have a lasting effect on them compared with you taking the time to thoroughly explain your reasoning behind your beliefs. Flashing your credentials is easy. It's also cheap and lazy. The pervasive overuse of strong words. I darn near guarantee that anyone watching this video knows what I mean by this, but for some obvious examples, Nazi, misogynist, racist, People will use strong words like these to essentially try to shame or guilt trip people into believing what they feel are the correct opinions. Another example of what this might look like is going up to someone who self-identifies as a feminist and automatically calling her a man-hater. It's possible that some feminists might become uncomfortable by this and look more closely at their ideology as a result, but I'd say it's probably pretty unlikely. Especially in today's climate, where these strongly overused words are pretty common and easily dismissed. On a similar note, using overly emotional appeals as a persuasive tactic? Very different from the genuinely emotional style of communication I discussed in my previous video, makes you come across as extremely artificial, and the distinction between real emotion and forced emotion is, generally speaking, quite obvious to most. Appeals to conformity. It should be obvious to anyone paying attention as to why it's a bad idea to use an argument like, more and more people are agreeing with our side, so therefore we're right. After all, look at how common anti-vaxxers are. Look at how prevalent ideologies like feminism still are. Don't try to push your beliefs just because you can point to other people believing similarly to you. Focus on the reasoning behind your beliefs. There are lots of other techniques like these, and I'll link a few pages of them in the low bar. The reason these techniques bother me is because they're not really focused on listening to the fine points of your debate opponents and actually trying to change their minds with facts or logic. They're not genuine ways to go about trying to influence people. They're more like sneaky tactics meant to exploit bits of human psychology in order to get a desired result. They're certainly not as likely, if likely at all, to result in any significant lasting change. On the contrary, if the person you're using them on is aware of these techniques, you can say goodbye to your credibility because you'll just wind up coming across like a seedy used car salesman rather than someone who's actually passionate about their cause. There's always the point to keep in mind where you can technically do everything right in a discussion and still fail to persuade someone. Again, I gotta say, you can't please all the people all the time, don't let it get you down, keep moving on and trying to convince others. Even if you manage to make only one other person reconsider their position, that other person might then go on to talk to other people about their newfound insights as well. I can see it in the people around me I talk to on a regular basis. There is positive change being had, and a lot of damaging narratives that have been prevalent and uncontested for so long are beginning to be challenged. It's not a lost battle. It's worth it to keep going. 
So that about wraps up what I had in mind for this discussion. I have an unrelated subject that I wanted to bring up at the end of this video. David Shackleton of Cathay Ottawa is currently in the process of trying to seek female chapter authors for his book, Daughters of Feminism 2. The first Daughters of Feminism was a great compilation of stories from people including Cassie J, Karen Strawn, and Janice Fiamengo. I'll put a link to an Amazon page for the book in the low bar. For this second book, I have been asked to write a chapter, as has Alison Tiemann. However, the book needs more female authors in order to have enough content for publishing. So, any female viewers of mine who might be interested in writing a chapter talking about your experiences with men's issues, or your challenges with feminism for this book, I encourage you to reach out to David Shackleton at david at genderhealing.com. I'll put that down in the low bar as well. Lastly, I know Patreon is a little bit of a dirty dog at the moment, but regardless, the Center for Men and Families in Calgary is still seeking donations. For this reason, I'm linking both the Patreon page and, if you prefer, the link to the one-time-only donation page that you can use to support the initiative, along with the instructions for how to do so. And as always, I'm also donating a portion of my own proceeds that I get from making these videos to that cause. In the meantime, I feel like a lot of subjects have come up that I could make a number of videos on over the next little while, so whenever I get the chance to, I'm going to be trying to work on scripts for those as much as is feasible. But for now, thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next one.